a number of uh, uh, really good databases began to be put together. The one that's on the screen right now is uh, in part based on uh, Anderson, Fott, and Gillum, who started the Clovis database uh, out of the University of Tennessee. And uh, they've done an excellent job for us and, and have enlisted state archaeologists to uh, provide uh, data on Clovis artifacts uh, for the database. And as that database began to take form, some things really started to stand out to me at least. And that is that the biggest concentration of Clovis people is in the east and southeast. And as you move westward, most of this area out here in the far west was not inhabited by Clovis people at least. Uh, one thing I want to make perfectly clear is that Clovis were perhaps the ancestors of Clovis may have been the first people to come, may not have been. We don't know because we really don't know what's going on here on the west coast. And there may be pre-Clovis people coming into North America from Asia, likely before uh, <clears throat> or along the, the uh, uh, Pacific coast and probably by boat. And yet knowing this, he still failed to make the connection. While Dennis Bradford was overlaying maps, he should have overlaid some more. Just overlaying pre-Clovis temperatures and terrain, we can see that the northwest United States terrain that was not covered by glaciers was mountainous and extremely cold. Those early boat travelers would have stayed hugging the coast that is now underwater until they reached much more southern climates that were more inviting. When the temperature got better farther north they would have migrated up, but avoiding the western mountains and desert, into the east-central regions. It is here that you see the various first indications of Clovis, which based on the highest concentrations, first were produced in quantity in the west Appalachian, and southern regions. It is also here, that we see the explosion of Clovis point usage. It is also this evidence that clearly points that the origin of Clovis technology was not from the northeast corner, but west and south of Appalachia. Bradford is disingenuous when he states. So just to give you an idea of the concentration, density of sites and artifacts, Clovis artifacts in eastern North America, I want you to look at the red dots on the eastern shore of the Delmarva Peninsula here, this area here. There are more Clovis sites on this little chunk of Delaware, Virginia, and Maryland than there are in the entire Rocky Mountains westward. Of course there are more points in that region than the Rocky Mountains westward. It is easy to make that claim when it is quite clear that pre-Clovis people were avoiding the mountainous region when they came down the coast. There would be no human remains there at all. Those remains would be in the coast, underwater. But what is really disingenuous is that Bradford doesn't state the real comparison he should have made. There are more points, west and south of the Appalachian Mountains than there are in the northeast. Period. It clearly speaks to the fusion from West Appalachia across to the northeast and with clear evidence that the Appalachian Mountains serve as a barrier to any major migration. Some of the people made it through, but nowhere near the concentration of the south and west. More importantly, if the diffusion had been from the northeast to the south and the west, we would not see a major gap of points between northeast and south. More than likely, the diffusion occurred from west to east across Appalachia, without a migration from the south northward to northeast. Now the final straw that, that broke my back at least was the discovery in Virginia of a site called Cactus Hill, which is south uh, east of uh, Richmond on the Nottoway River for those of you who uh, know Virginia. And at this site was stratified, starting off the colonial time period and moving back through like pages of books, uh, down to Paleo-Indian time periods, and then a nice Clovis level with classic Clovis stuff. And then a few centimeters below that, they found the unspeakable. This is a clear strawman, as the concept that people came here before Clovis is not new. We are clearly seeing that there were pre-Clovis people. But what is lacking in evidence is any claim that these pre-Clovis people were from Europe. There, there's a relationship here in terms of bifacial technology. Uh, we have a blade technology, which Clovis also has a well-developed blade technology. 
But the difference between these projectile points is that these uh, in the lower level were not fluted. But one thing that occurred to me at the time uh, was that uh, these projectile points and the blade technology look remarkably like salutrian. And Bruce, this is Bruce here, this is my wife Peggy, that's me, uh, in case you didn't recognize me. Uh, Bruce had talked about a, a, a technique called overshot flaking, which was used uh, as a purposeful technique by the Salutrian people and as a purposeful technique by Clovis people. Uh, you see it in almost any uh, lithic technology, but when you see it in cultures that are not those two specific cultures, it usually represents a mistake made by the flint napper and usually results in a broken artifact. These are subjective assertions that are empirically unsubstantiated. In regard to overshot flaking, even a cursory examination of illustrations of foliate pieces from Middle and Early Upper Paleolithic contexts, that is long before 20,000 years ago, in Central and Eastern Europe, as well as from Aturian ones in Northwest Africa and Middle Stone Age ones from Central and Southern Africa, for example Lupemban, Stilby, suggests that overshot invasive flaking was not exclusive to Solitrian or Clovis. Moreover, the ubiquity of overshot flaking in Clovis is hardly demonstrated. Indeed, this technological feature occurs only rarely in fluted points in eastern North America, and is most characteristic of the more classic Clovis forms from the desert southwest and the southern high plains. Even there, however, it does not occur in high frequency. In a large sample, 4,500 specimens of Clovis points from Texas, of which 208 can be examined for the presence absence of overshot flaking, only 12% display the technique. Not all Clovis technology involves overshot flaking. Not all overshot flaking is Clovis or Solutrian. number of professional archaeologists that say, oh, that stuff sure looks like Solutrian, or that Solutrian stuff sure looks like Clovis, but nobody was serious because, you know, you had the Atlantic Ocean out there. Uh, and there was five, six thousand years of difference in time, so eh, it's independent invention, convergence, whatever you want to say. And it was totally ignored. Well, in the meantime, we figured out that, you know, over in the Pacific, 40,000 plus years, folks were sailing around boats. I like how he slips in sailing. No evidence of sailing. Probably rudimentary watercrafts with paddles. Let us put it in context. We know people had some type of aquatic raft because they were able to reach Australia. But 40,000 years ago, Australia was not anywhere near the distance that the Americas were from Europe. From Sunda to Sahal was an island hopping distance away, with no island being more than a day's distance away from the other. Furthermore, we know this was in a temperate region where the waters would not have been constantly rough and choppy, and riddled with icebergs. A boat are a pretty good idea, aren't they? They kind of change your perspective of the world because oceans, lakes, rivers, waterways in general no longer are barriers, but they are highways. I wonder what highways he travels. Maybe the type that are going through monsoons and major floods. This graph is actually from a study that looked at sediments deposited from icebergs through the last glacial maximum. They show us the routes that icebergs were traveling and thus which way the currents were pushing. All indications are of currents pushing south and east in a choppy, cold Atlantic, riddled with dangerous icebergs. Hardly a highway.